Good morning. It's good to see, um, or not see, but um, be with all of you this morning. Um, I hope all of you are doing well. Um, today's lesson is about the two witnesses in the end time. Um, we're going to be talking about the 1260-day uh, ministry of the two witnesses that was sent by God during this time to give the people another opportunity to repent and to turn to him. And this is in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. In a prophetic year, there is a 360-day lunar year. The tribulation period is 2,520 days. So each half is 1,260 days, which is 42 months. In Revelation 11, 2, Daniel 7, 25, and 12, 7, describes this time, this as time, times, and half a time, which is one year plus two years plus one half year. So this equals three and a half years. So this vision was showed to John, and it took place between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. The sounding of the seventh trumpet is, the, is when the kingdom of God will become physical. So at this present time, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. But when he returns in power and glory, the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of Christ. So in our previous lessons, we studied about how the first three and a half years of the tribulation period were peaceful. And Satan had allowed the Jews to again offer sacrifices at the temple. Well, the two uh, witnesses, they're going to begin their miracle ministry at the same time that the Antichrist desecrates the newly built temple in Jerusalem and he puts a stop to the offering of the sacrifices by the Jews. So this will be the last half of the Great Tribulation. And the two witnesses will minister exactly 1,260 days. You know, a lot of people, uh, Bible scholars, other uh, Christian uh, people who study the Bible a lot, have put a lot of attention on identifying these two witnesses. But it's more important to know what they will do and what will happen to them. And you know, John, uh, John um, God could have revealed to him the identities of these two witnesses if he had chosen to. But the great lesson here is the love and concern of God even when God, when uh, people have rejected his son and his offers of mercy and grace. God is long-suffering to mankind, and he's going to give them every opportunity to repent before the final destruction. And you know, God is still showing his mercy and his grace today by giving people every opportunity to come to him and repent and turn their lives over to him. These two witnesses will be bearing testimony to the truth of God in Jerusalem during the terrible time that the Antichrist will persecute the Jews and anyone else who testifies of Jesus Christ. Our scripture today comes from Revelation 11, 1 through 14. And our key verse is, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, Clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 11.3 And our application is the student will summarize the work of the two witnesses and discuss his being a witness in the world today. <clears throat> so in Revelation uh, 11, 1 through 6 I'm going to read. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise. And measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn in the blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So John was given a reed, and it's like a rod, and he was told to measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So what is a reed? It's a bamboo-like cane that grew along the banks of the Jordan River, and it was known that it could reach up to 20 feet. They were used for walking sticks, fishing poles, writing instruments, and even as musical instruments. And they also could be stripped and used to weave baskets, like the one baby Moses was put in. But John was, was to use this reed as a measuring stick, and so we are not told the length that John was given. The symbolic act of measuring is a way of making or establishing a claim to property. So God was saying that the temple belongs to him. So... In today's time, you know, when we buy a piece of property, um, we have it surveyed or measured by someone, so we will know what belongs to us and what belongs to someone else. Uh, we want to know what our boundary lines are. So John was told to measure the inner rooms of the temple and not the outer courts. The outer courts was given to the Gentiles, and they will have control of it for three and a half years. So... In Israel today, there is a group called the Temple Institute. They have worked on plans for a new temple for years. They've been working on temple furniture and instruments as well as training men for the priesthood. So today, there is someone right now working on building a new temple. The angel told John to measure the altar and them that worship therein. The altar in the court of the priests was the brazen altar of sacrifice. The altar in the holy place was known as the altar of incense. It seems John was instructed to measure the brazen altar or altar of sacrifice. And those who worshipped therein would be priests, Levites, and any others who were allowed to enter this area. And John was not really told why he was to measure these things, but he obeyed um, this angel, and he did as he was told. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, The heart of an individual believer is now the temple of God. And this truth is not exclusively for Gentiles. There is one plan of salvation for everyone. The angel told John not to measure the outer court because it was given to the Gentiles and the holy city would be tread underfoot for 42 months. Jerusalem is going to suffer greatly under the hand of the Antichrist and all those who are aligned with them. But even in these terrible times, God is going to still extend his hand of mercy. The two witnesses will preach God's message and they will expose the man of sin for the lies and deception he has told man. And these witnesses are under the protection of God and there can't be stopped or silenced until their work is done. Men will try to hurt these witnesses, but these witnesses will be able to, um, there will be, they'll be able to have fire come out of their mouth and destroy those who seek to harm them. Um, they're given remarkable power over the physical universe. Um, they have the power to stop rainfall on the earth, to turn water into blood, and to bring about plagues. What does this remind us of? This reminds us of Egypt. And when Moses went to get the children of God out of Egypt, uh, of all the plagues and stuff that, that was put upon uh, Egypt at this time, this does not bring repentance uh, then, and it doesn't bring repentance to evil men during this time. <clears throat> God gives these two witnesses the, the ability to do the work that they need to do. <clears throat> they will be guided by the Spirit of God, in what they say and what they do. 
So when God calls you to do a work for him, he's going to give you what you need to do that job. The identity of these two witnesses will not be important to those who hear them. <clears throat> the message that they preach is what is going to be most important. <clears throat> these witnesses, are they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. Uh, sackcloth was a rough, coarse cloth that was worn by Old Testament prophets as a sign of their distress. So these two witnesses, they wear the sackcloth to show the seriousness of their message in light of all the terrible, horrific things that will exist on earth that during that time. So we see how um, it's showing that these witnesses, they were serious about what they were doing. And so we need more people today, more preachers, teachers, Christians, who are going to take the word of God and they're going to preach it boldly and clearly and unapologetically in the spirit of love. So our world today desperately needs this. The time is growing short before the Lord comes back to get his children. <clears throat> Next is the verses 7 through 10, and I'm going to read that. <clears throat> and when they, have, they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that descendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. So these two witnesses are going to offer people another chance to repent and trust the Lord. But they're going to have enemies, and uh, when they're, uh, but when their testimony is complete, the Antichrist or the beast will come out of the bottomless pit, and he'll wage war against these two men. He's going to overcome them, and he'll finally be able to kill them. But that will not happen unless God, and, but God has allowed this to happen. But it wouldn't happen if God did not allow it. This will happen in Jerusalem and in Israel. The city of Jerusalem and the Middle East will be the center of all that is happening. There's going to be a celebration over all the earth when these witnesses are killed. The enemies of the two witnesses will show their contempt for them by not allowing them to be buried. Instead, the idol-worshipping haters of God will desecrate their bodies and treat them as trophies to all the world to see. They're going to lay in the streets for three and a half days dead. In our modern world today, in our technology, we can easily see how their bodies could be preserved and the whole world could view their dead bodies. This shows the moral decline of the world. People will rejoice that they have died. A celebration will break out worldwide with a gift exchange. Today, when do we exchange gifts? We change the gifts on our birthdays, Christmas, which is our celebration of the birth of Christ. We exchange gifts um, at Christmas time to show the gift of eternal life that Christ has given to all believers. and uh, But these people, they're celebrating the death of these witnesses because of their witness of Christ. And because they are revealing to these people their sins. And they don't want to hear this. This will be the climax of the world's hatred of Christ. We are seeing this hatred for the things of God in the world today. This evil celebration of the death of the two witnesses who were sent to warn the people of destruction yet to come will also, as we said, involve the exchange of gifts. Perhaps these people think with the death of the two witnesses, they can carry on with their plans and see their wicked dreams and desires fulfilled. The same could be said today. There are some that think that if they could get God out of the way and the Bible along with Christians and the church, that their life could be improved. 
Revelations 11, 11 through 14. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to God in heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. For three and a half years, the, the work of these witnesses will be looked on by the world as torment. These two lonely voices will be the last holdout to the complete rule of the Antichrist. Sinful mankind will think of the man of the man of sin is going to have all the solutions to all the disasters that's brought about by the opening of the seals and the sounding of the trumpets. After three and a half days of laying in the street dead, the spirit of life from God will come to the witnesses again. They will stand to their feet. Can you just imagine all the people that are standing around and they see, see these two men? They've been dead for three and a half days and they see them stand to their feet and they're alive. Um, when, when the men are brought to life, uh, back to life again and the public is seeing this, they're, they're going to hear a voice telling them, come hither, that their work is on earth is done and they are summoned back into heaven. Can you imagine not only seeing them stand to their feet and they're alive, but seeing them rise up in the clouds into heaven? This will terrify those that witness them coming back to life and them ascending up to heaven. They will watch helplessly and in disbelief as this happens. And after this happens, within an hour, of these witnesses leaving Jerusalem, there's going to be a great earthquake in the city. One tenth of the city is destroyed. Seven thousand men are killed at this time. The earthquake is a demonstration of the ultimate power of God. The celebration that has gone on for days is going to come to a halt. The promises of the man of sin are finally revealed as lies. Men who see this are afraid, and they attribute these works to God, but yet they're not, they won't turn their lives over to him. The world is not going to turn their life over to God. You know, we all die. We're all going to die one day. And if we're a child of God, we're going to be made alive again. Jesus is different from all the false gods of this world. He was born a virgin. He died publicly. He was resurrected. And praise God, his tomb is empty. And that makes all the difference. God will take care of his own. A lost world wants to believe that death is final. That evil and good stop alike when we die. But we know that that is not the truth. Death only moves us from one realm to another. It's either going to be heaven or hell. Our bodies perish, but our soul lives on. There is eternal punishment. But we can have the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this, these events brings us to the end of the second woe, which is the sixth trumpet. But there's going to be a li uh, very little reprieve because the third woe is going to come quickly. The third row, woe will be the seventh trumpet, and this will bring about the close of the seven-year tribulation. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be the witnesses that God would have us to be. The time is short. We should want all that we come in contact with to accept Jesus as our Savior, and we should work at that. I thank you, and let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, Lord, and that we can study them. Lord, we thank you for your gift that you've given us of eternal life. 
And all we have to do, Lord, is to repent and accept. And you will uh, usher us into heaven with you one day. Lord, I thank you for this. Lord, I pray for all those out there that don't know you and don't want to know you, Lord. I just pray that you'll burden their hearts, Lord, and help them to see their need before it's everlasting too late. Because one day it will be too late, Lord. Lord, I thank you for all your blessings, Lord, and I just ask that you bless each and every one. Lord, those that are hurting today, I just ask that you bless them and that you will meet their needs, Lord. Those that are uh, lost their loved ones today, Lord, I just pray that you'll be with them, Lord. Comfort them. And Lord, those that are sick, Lord, I just pray that you'll touch and heal if it's in thy precious will. In thy name we pray. Amen.